Hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome to This Week in Mormons, the inappropriate Linnean podcast for the past three years because we've yet to think of a new name to call ourselves. So we remain twim for the time being. Please visit us at thisweekinmormons.com where you can see the any show notes for our podcast as well as other great content that we have and our, our team of uh, bloggers over there contributing and join us on social media. And of course, I would love to pitch Patreon once more. Support the show on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash This Week in Mormons. And when you go there, you can pledge two, three bucks a month, whatever you're you're happy doing. And that just helps us pay for this whole thing. So we don't usually bombard you with ads or uh, or anything like that. We consider this a public service or something similar to it. We are thrilled this week uh, to be joined by a, a great luminary uh, within the Latter-day Saint space. We are joined this week by Keith Erickson. Keith is an award-winning author, teacher, and public historian. Uh, since 2014, he has worked for the Church History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, directing the Church History Library. So if you've ever seen that building across Main Street from uh, the Conference Center, that's like Keith's domain. That's his house right there. Um, he also, he uh, he focuses quite a bit on historical outreach and public engagement, and he also serves on the editorial board of the Church Historians Press. Uh, he's authored numerous books and articles and topics, including politics, hoaxes, Abraham Lincoln, Elvis Presley, and church history. I like that that runs the gamut. As a quick aside, that's like a friend of mine who has a YouTube channel that focuses on travel, jewelry, and home automation. We're just covering it. We cover everything. I'm just kidding. Um, but he's written a number of great books and been published in scholarly journals, including the Journal of American History, The History Teacher, the Journal of Abraham Lincoln Association, uh, the Oral History Review, and Latter-day Saint History Journals. So we want to give a warm This Week in Mormons welcome to Keith Erickson. Hello, Keith. Hi, thanks for the invitation. It's a great for great for to have you here with us. Thanks for agreeing to be with us this week. And before we continue, I often forget to introduce Jared. Every time we do interviews, I forget Jared. Jared Gillens is here too to help along with the interview because Jared's awesome. Jared, how are you doing, pal? I'm good. I'm good. Thank I'm you for remembering me. I appreciate it. It's so often like in post production, I'm like scrambling to record some. No, splice it's good to intro. be seen, Jeff. It's good to be seen. <laughs> so I don't forget you. Um, so uh, Keith, of course, does have a new book out. That's part of the reason we're talking today. I'll hold it up here for our YouTube viewers: "Real versus Rumor: How to Dispel Latter Day Saint Myths." This is a cool book. Uh, it speaks to a lot of the things Jared and I are interested in, namely, and it's not just a rundown of. Um, you know, like lies your mother told you, that kind of thing. It's not just reading through. Here are all the random things and apocryphal anecdotes we have as Latter-day Saints. Although it's, there are uh, a few of those. There are a few of those to provide examples, but I think it's about a little bit more than that. It's kind of about how to equip ourselves to discern truth from error, for example. But uh, we'll let Keith speak to that himself. So, uh, Keith, for those who don't know you, know your history, do you want to give us a quick rundown of just yourself and your background and uh, what took you to the church history library? Sure. On the uh, personal side, I grew up in Maryland, just outside of Baltimore, and then um, served a mission in Brazil. I did some undergraduate work and then kind of figured out that I liked history and went on to do a PhD in history at Indiana University and then I was a history professor in the Indiana University system and also the, uh, uh, the University of Texas system. And so I was uh, six years at the University of Texas at El Paso, uh, earned tenure there. And I also uh, crossed over a little to the dark side, became uh, the special assistant to the university president. So I worked in the administration. And oh, in no. particular, I was managing our centennial celebration. So... It was from there that uh, the invitation came and we kind of thought it through and uh, decided to make the leap into um, to working for the church. So it's a simple now you say an invitation came. I mean, was, was it an open slot and you saw the you saw the opportunity and networked for it? Or did someone approach you and say, Brother Erickson, we, we need you in this role? Yeah, it was a little bit of uh, a both. I mean, it, it was officially a, a job application and had to fill out all the things. So it wasn't like a calling or something where they just came and uh, and made me do it. Uh, but they, they had been talking to me for a while, kind of asking, oh, would you ever be interested? And uh, usually I was busy. You know, I was on sabbatical one time, so I wasn't going to give that up for a new job. And uh, then other times I was just doing cool projects. And uh, so... 
this time they came around and all the, the pieces just kind of fit. So. So you mentioned, um, and I think Jeff also mentioned it's part of your bio that you, you you're labeled as a public historian, and, and we were curious what that exactly means. What is a public historian, and is that as opposed to like an academic historian, or or what? Yeah, that's a great question. It's basically as a field uh, within the study of history. Uh, most of the fields are oriented around kind of subjects. So you may become an expert on the, you know, the Civil War or something like that. Uh, Public history kind of shifts the. Uh oh, I lost my thing. Start that over. I'm assuming he lost you can, his mic, people. I'm assuming you it's can okay. cut stuff, right? Um. So public history kind of shifts the angle. So it's less about uh, the subject matter and more about how the public engages with history. So it's in it's interested in uh, historic sites, museums history classrooms, and but there's a particular focus. In fact, kind of the leading focus is how do people respond? How do they react? How do they engage? What does it mean when somebody shows up somewhere and learns about history? Jared, does that satisfy you? It does. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense um, to me. Yeah, I, thank you. That is interesting, the study of, of the public response to things. So so what does one do in your role as a director of the Church History Library? What does that actually mean? I'm sure every day is different, but typical day-to-day yeah. -day basis, what does your role entail? You know, that kind of a position in many ways is, uh, is an administrative position. Uh, the library has, oh, probably 75 to 80 employees, kind of depending on what positions are filled and what projects are going. There's another 110 or so missionaries uh, that are that are involved in the work. And so there is just a lot of administration, uh, you know, kind of overseeing staff, overseeing work. Uh, maybe one of the things that surprised me the most is how much of that involves kind of uh, technical infrastructure. There were uh, there are 48 different computer systems that we use to manage things. So. There's an online catalog. There are, you know, internal databases. There are uh, systems we use to c communicate with patrons. And so uh, that was actually a lot of kind of IT work or working with uh, IT partners who, who provided those kinds of services. Wait a minute. So are we actually talking to a historian right now or are we talking to an administrator? I want to be clear. We're a I think well, you still know your stuff, though. It seems well, that yes, way. you know, uh, but yeah, you asked the the day to day job yeah. what is administrative, and you know, even for the the book, I I got up at four a.m. That's something I wrote on my personal time. It wasn't a a job oh. function, and so, uh, but every now, well, often, you know, history comes in to the administration, but but it's a lot of administering. So. Yeah. Well, well, you mentioned the book. Um, I mean, you've been a historian for. You know, over 20 years. What did, was there anything in particular that compelled you to write this book at this moment in history on your own time, as you said? Yeah. You know, um, I guess the first thing would be these are the topic is something I've long been interested in. Uh, and we talked about my work as a public historian at UTEP. I taught classes to uh, future history teachers. Uh, people would come back, get uh, graduate degrees in history. And so I taught the courses on how to think like a historian, how to teach historical thinking skills. Uh, we also did that kind of that kind of work in uh, consulting at, at historic sites and things like that. So uh, my publishing uh, has been in that field uh, and and a related field called the scholarship of uh, teaching and learning in history. So that's what I've generally been interested in throughout my career. But then specifically coming to the Church History Library. I just found a lot of instances where we had, you know, challenges or, or funny encounters where I just thought, you know, this would have been a whole lot easier if the people we were working with knew how history works, if they knew how to think about things rather than just not think about things. And so it was kind of that convergence of my long term interest and then just kind of coming to Utah, coming to the kind of. Mormony church history culture and saying, oh, wow, they need some help. <laughs> we all need help. Yeah. Well, and I think that kind of 
um, segues into another question that we, we had and you know back in the beginning as you're explaining the purpose of the book on the just on the second page you're talking about this need for sort of protecting ourselves against the rumors and the things that are not true that we encounter in stories or in Sunday school etc and you say and I'm going to kind of paraphrase this but it says the best protection lies in knowing how good thinking works and I was really interested in that term good thinking because it seems you know on the surface good thinking is a really broad a generic term but I think you mean something very specific by that. And I think you go throughout the rest of the book defining what good thinking is. But if you had to succinctly define what you meant by good thinking, how would you describe it or explain it to somebody? Yeah, you know, I think it's uh, it's about having a discipline in your thinking, having habits. It's not something you can kind of just turn on and turn off. You, you kind of develop habits that do certain things. So uh, when information is presented to you, you are asking, where is the evidence? You're asking about context. How does it fit? You know, this is one little fact or something. What are all the other pieces of information it's related to? There's a kind of evaluation impulse to it. Uh, and, you know, we're swimming in information, the information age. So you can get 15 billion hits on Google. So which one is the the right one, the good one, the best one? Uh, and so those kind of uh, habits are things that we have to literally train our brains to do. Our brains, uh, the past maybe 40, 50 years of research in cognitive science shows that our brains actually hate thinking. They avoid thinking. They, they'd prefer not to think. They'd want to have habits and routines. And so if you really want to think better, you've got to get down in that level, at the level of your, of your habits and reflexes. That's like athletes they call it muscle memory. It's not really their muscles. It's really their brain. But it comes by training and repeating so that in a moment, you can just respond with uh, with good skills rather than flailing around. Uh, it, it makes me think about our own faith community a little bit. And I, I think, um, you know, misinformation has been on the rise for years. I think we've seen that exacerbated a little bit in the past handful of years in particular, and social media doesn't help. And, and like the book contains a lot of that, sort of this guidebook on how to improve what we do. Um, there was a recent study, this is just popping in my head, that showed kind of an alarm, I forgot what the percentage was, but an alarming percentage of members of our church believed in the QAnon conspiracy, for example, yeah. which is per, not to editorialize, but to me, a little bit troubling and interesting. Um, do you it's feel also like worth noting the caveat that even the study noted that the sample size yes. might not have been great for that? But yes, even considering a small sample size, something like ten percent of those surveyed were susceptible to QAnon ideas. So yeah. So I mean, in your in your research, do you think that we as a faith group or in a, in a social group are we more susceptible to scams, rumors, and the like than maybe other comparable groups? You know, that's a hard question. And there's other interesting kind of data, like about um, Utah being the scam capital of the world, uh, or of the United States, at least. Um, uh, so I don't know. Uh, susceptibility is probably harder to pin down. I do think one thing that happens to Latter-day Saints uh, is, and I talk about it a little bit in the book, is we will let our guard down because of the, of a shared community. And so if someone is a, holds a position of trust, then there are assumptions. Oh, this person must be giving me good business advice when maybe it might be bad business advice. Uh, but, but there are ways where, but that's, that's kind of in group out group stuff. Other groups do that too. So I don't know that it's unique, Mm -hmm. but I think the fact that community is so important to us just means there are a lot more, uh, potential for us to have someone in our in-group who doesn't have our interests at heart. Yeah. I mean, you kind of referenced affinity fraud there, which, which seems to happen yeah. quite a bit in Utah because we want to trust those with our group. And I'm actually, I'm actually thinking of um, one of our other co-hosts who's an author, Soraya Wilson is, a. she spoke to me once about how she interviewed an FBI agent who was assigned to Salt Lake city to do research for a book. The FBI helped her out. And in interviewing him, he was just like, this is like the most corrupt place I've ever served in. And you wouldn't think that, you know, we have this image as Latter-day Saints, but I think a lot of it might might play into that same thing. We want to trust our brothers and sisters and then at the same. And also, I think we have an element of the, of the fantastical as part of our religious lore, in a sense, 
and perhaps all those things together and somewhere like Utah where where there's more cultural hegemony for example uh, with amongst the church members can can lead to things like that so Chip. all that being said and established and I want to word this carefully but um, you know we are as members of this church uh, who, who have made covenants, um, you know, are, are supposed to be God's covenant people and we are striving to be. One of the things that we're supposed to be good at is discerning between truth and things that are not truth. So, so why would we have this susceptibility or this tendency to follow affinity fraud or rumor or untrue things when we're supposed to be really good at avoiding that? You know, I think the most important word in your question is supposed to. Okay. Uh, because I don't think we are. And and uh, one piece of evidence I would point to is when President Nelson became president of the church, he came out right away talking about revelation, personal revelation. We need to understand how it works. We need to get better at it. He's talked repeatedly about learning how to hear him. I I'm hearing a very clear message uh, that we need to get better at revelation uh, and discernment and and promptings. Else, why would he be talking so much about it? And so, uh, I, I that's my takeaway: is we're supposed to be good, but we're not. And uh, if my book can help, then great. <laughs> good. And, and you we, mentioned. Uh, oh, go ahead, Jared. Go ahead. Please. No, you go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I think earlier in the book too, you sort of talk about. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but essentially history is history. The past is the past. Like I think we naturally want to dig into things. And, and of course we want to find new records and new information, but it's very easy to fill in the gaps with our own things that we're seeking, if that makes sense. I don't want to misrepresent your words. Um, and I like some of the things you even mentioned that we don't have records of, and we don't think much about this. Like we don't know who the original six members of the church were, for example. Um, and that's something I don't think many of us think about in our own in our in our faith community that we, we don't know. And also, like we don't have that detailed account of the Melchizedek priesthood restoration compared to the Aaronic, for example. We have very specific dates when John the Baptist showed up, but not the other ones. We just know it happened at a certain time. Um, and you mentioned here you have a quote. You say we cannot visit the past as if it were another country. We must study the records that survive while remembering that they do not represent the entirety of the past. So you talk a lot about the past as the past, but like, what do you mean by that? How do, in what way do we need to be thinking differently when you're saying that the past is the past? Yeah, I think there are a lot of ways that we just assume that the past was just like us. And so we assume if I say the word democracy, a person in 1830 would think the exact same thing I'm thinking when they say the word democracy. And, you know, that's just not so. Another one of our bad assumptions is this, to assume that we know everything about the past. And we have little sayings like history, hindsight is 2020. Well, no, it's not, because we actually have lost most of what was there in the past. The people are all dead. The, the culture is different. Uh, language is different. Uh, experiences, travel, communication, health, hygiene. I mean, all kinds of things are different. So, so that becomes the first kind of, um, I don't know, the first part of humility to realize, okay, we have just uh, some traces of the past and we're trying to put them together and do our best. And on top of that, you also point out in the book that you know, even when we do have those pieces of the past to put together, even if we have really great records, that there is no history without interpretation. Like every time a history is presented to us, it's through an interpreter, whether it's somebody giving a speech or somebody writing a book or an article, etc. And it's really interesting. And I think that's another thing that it's really easy to forget, because like you said, we want to just say, well, this is the facts. These are the facts of the past. And you, but then you have to stop and say, well, which facts and how are these facts being presented? I, I remember having a conversation with a friend, this is probably 10 or 15 years ago, and she was uh, very much into this uh, very popular political commentator, pundit type, who was known for his history lessons. And he would just, you know, put out a blackboard and outline it and say, this is history, and therefore this is what we draw from it. And, she, and when I said, well, you know, I don't necessarily agree with everything he says, or some of that stuff is it, that he's is advocating for isn't quite right, she'd say, but he's presenting the history. It's just the facts. It's just the history. And I'd say, but which history? Whose history? Which facts? And she didn't understand and or didn't want to, want to understand 
that there is always subjectivity because there's always interpretation. And that's a good thing to bear in mind, but it's very easy to forget. And I forget it too, you know, and I'll read, uh, you know, a, a history that I enjoy. And because I like it, I accept it. I think, oh, this is a good story. And it, sometimes it's just easy to fail to do that critical good thinking step and say, well, what are the right questions I should be asking about this? Yeah, and I think we get trained that way in schools. In school, history is presented, frankly, like every other subject. There's a textbook, you read it, you memorize it, you you spit back the answers and pass the test. But that's really nothing at all like the way we have to do history in normal life. So, so it requires a kind of a, a new mindset that doesn't just say there are facts in the textbook or on the chalkboard that I memorize. It's... I got to think about it. I got to dig in. I got to see who's interpreting. And there are hidden interpreters. The most obvious one is the person speaking. But at the level of, a, of an archive or a library, who picked which records that uh, survive? Who decided, ah, oh, mom's journal's not worth it. We'll just throw it out. Who, who decided to donate? Who decided to keep? Who decides? You know, there's, there are multiple layers before it, long before the information gets to us where people have been interpreting, making assessments about the value of that information. It's kind of funny when you said that, because I thought of Mormon, honestly, like in some ways Mormon chose what to include in the golden plates and whatnot. I, I, I stand by his work. I think we're okay with it. But, um, but even that's an example of some, I mean, I'm sure there were things Mormon opted not to include in his record. That's oh, yeah. You have to think about it that way. If, if you look at like, uh, I think Grant Hardy's book, Understanding the Book of Mormon is a wonderful study into that. Like, cause he says, well, let's take, you know, it's funny cause it's an academic book, but he says, let's, t- let's, let's assume a Mormon's a real person and let's take him at his word for who he is and what he's doing. And we have to look at and understand that he is crafting a narrative and he is choosing what to include and what not to include, how, when to quote people, when not to quote people, you know, when, you know, wh- which stories to emphasize and which ones to pass over quickly. So, yeah, even Mormon. Mormon's an interpreter, too. And what I like about Mormon is he's almost obsessed with reminding us that he is an interpreter because he mm-hmm. tells us over and over there's only a hundred part, a hundredth part of the things that I can even mention. And he, he talks, oh, there's lots of other records. And he says, well, I'm abridging it. I'm compiling it. Moroni later worries about it. He, he's up at night worrying, wow, we got so many errors because we left stuff out. People are going to mock this. I think, uh, you know, as, as a historian, as someone who works with archives and records, I think it's really fascinating how obsessed, and they're, you know, they pay attention to who handed it to whom and when and the pat, I mean, they're really, really careful about being aware that they are part of uh, the production of something. And it's not just, it didn't just come out of the sky, carved in stone. They, they were people, they were involved in creating it, and they know that it's a human product with human failings. Yeah, it's funny we're kind of talking about the Book of Mormon um, things right now. I'm thinking about some parts in the book a couple pop into my mind right now. And I, we're drifting a little bit from just the previous topic, but um, I liked when you referenced Nephi, the Nephi of, of third Nephi primarily, and how he sort of, and I'm totally paraphrasing. I'm sure you know the quote better than I do, but he essentially s- says like, oh, that you could be like Nephi of old, the original Nephi and how wonderful everything was with them. And you make a point to say like, even that third Nephi, Nephi, a lot of Nephi's thrown around, even he sort of had a, some rose tinted glasses the way he looked at it. Cause when you look back at the original record of Nephi and his brothers, it's like, well, no, like half his brothers were problematic and didn't listen and needed chastening. And, um, it's, it, it was cool to read that and think about that in the book of Mormon. Cause it's a different way to study it in general, when you're going through it and realizing even those who were hundreds of years later had surely developed, uh, I'm sure they greatly revered the original Nephi, and perhaps so much to a degree that you forget some of the bad, even even though, of course, the great um, adversaries of the Book of Mormon are named after, you know, Laman and Lemuel and stuff. But um, I thought that was interesting. And I also love the one, this is just going more into some of the classic, just Latter-day Saint things that we believe, how we often assume that Alma the Elder was translated or or something like that. And there's no record to... Uh, to back that up. All we know is it just says he went into another land and was never heard from again. Like it's like the equivalent of Hagoth. It's like the exact right. same level of knowledge that we have of what happened to the individual. Um, and it's fun uh, to what, see Mormon wrestling with that. Mormon yeah. as the abridger is saying, well, 
the rumor, or he uses the term, the saying went abroad in the land that he was taken up. But then Mormon just worked backs, you know, backs it, backtracks as well. We don't have, we can't say anything like that. So we'll just say he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> and we, this speaks. But no, we go don't. with uh, saying that went abroad with the land. Uh, we don't watch Mormons careful thinking through the evidence and the information. Yeah. So that's interesting. And this sort of speaks to this idea of, um, first-hand, second-hand accounts. And you have a section about that in the book. Assuming some of our listeners don't fully grasp what that is, can you explain the difference between first-hand, second-hand accounts, inference, and just give us a quick rundown of what that is and why it's important? Yeah. And I'll preface it with uh, with the, just the caveat that these aren't hard and fast rules because we're dealing with people and memory and there's a lot of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. So I, I present it as, as a rule of thumb with exceptions. But the rule of thumb uh, among historians is that we prefer uh, accounts from people who were there firsthand. So they, they saw it with their eyes, they heard it with their ears, they were participants. And we, we prefer that to things that we call secondhand, that somebody was there at the event and then told me about it, or further, third hand down the, down the line. And the reason we prefer that is that, you know, it's like that old telephone game. As you pass information down the line, it changes. And so historians are always wary of, you know, what has happened to the information as it's gone from one person to another uh, and to another. Now, the caveat there, though, is that sometimes the firsthand witnesses don't understand everything. And, you know, take as an example, the person who is in a, an automobile accident, they're there. They're a firsthand uh, eyewitness. But a lot of things can happen in that moment. Trauma, uh, you know, uh, concern, worry, just the physical impact, uh, possibly, uh, you know, depending on how the crash works, brain damage. So you can't make the iron fast rule that only a firsthand witness is what, what I will listen to because some firsthand witnesses just don't uh, don't capture it all. Uh, then there's the person with their back to the accident who hears the noise and turns. They didn't see anything. They heard the noise. They turned, but by the time they're looking, it's all happened. They can see. They can speak to there was a pile of uh, you know debris or whatever, but they can't speak to cause or how it unfolded. So mm -hmm. so we're kind of dealing with uh, a preference for firsthand, but a general awareness that. And because the past is gone, we're going to look for all the witnesses we can and then evaluate them and, and put together the best picture that, that we can. And one thing I know from firsthand accounts is that there's a great story here that, of course, the uh, when the Japanese raided Pearl Harbor, That's that they tried right. to bomb the temple and didn't succeed. But this is actually in the book is an interesting example of firsthand accounts themselves not always being credible. You want to I don't want to spoil yeah. the book, but do you want to want to burst some bubbles here of everyone who's been telling that one in Sunday school for years? Sure, we have we yeah. do have two firsthand accounts uh, of this uh, story, and and that's partly I think why it survives. But uh, one of them was a person on the shore uh, at the time, and he uh, but he started to tell the story twenty years later. <clears throat> so that's another kind of rule of thumb we have about uh, historical evidence is that we prefer it closer to the event. So we wish he would have talked about it sooner, but he didn't. The other challenge we have with this witness is uh, he was admittedly, self-confessedly hung over. Uh, he had come home. He'd been out drinking, come home late. His wife was mad at him and she locked the door. And so he had to sleep outside in the yard, which is why uh, he says he was able to, uh, to see the planes because he was already outdoors. Now, one chal uh, second challenge is he went fishing with his buddy the next day and his buddy reported, uh, he didn't tell me anything about it. He never said anything about this until 20 years later uh, when he started to talk. The other firsthand account also has challenges. It, it comes from years later uh, from missionaries who were in Japan who claimed that they taught uh, a, a man. And when they pulled out the picture of the Laie temple, the man got really excited and told them that he was the pilot. Uh, who left his squadron and tried to bomb it. Now, the challenge there is that both missionaries were American. They'd been out for a couple of months. They also admitted that they, they didn't really understand Japanese totally. Uh, and so both of those firsthand witnesses have challenges. And then when you go to the surrounding witnesses and context, there's just, it's 
pretty clear that it's uh, extremely unlikely that an event like that would happen. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> We're sorry if that was your favorite story. Uh, I want to go back and, and, and continue kind of another one of the threads that I think we can pull out of what we were saying previously about this idea that, you know, like even Mormon is interpreting and even, you know, we don't, you know, he's, he's putting in what the rumor is about Alma, but we're not quite sure. And, and even Nephi can have a misconception about how things were, or, 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 or at least for the sake of the narrative, he's trying to present conveniently forget that Laman and Lamuel were awful to his brother to their brother. Um, so, and you discuss this in the book and you don't go into great detail, but you do remind us <clears throat> of this idea that we don't believe in infallible prophets, that there are um, things that come out and it can be, and, and there's, I loved this story that you told uh, there, there's this um, quote from Joseph Fielding Smith and where, where he talked about how he didn't believe that God would allow men to leave earth and go to the moon or, 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 you know, to, to you know, to space and then later in 19, and this was back in the 50s, and then in 1969, after a successful Apollo mission, somebody asked him about that, and he just said, well, I was wrong, wasn't I? And, you know, and so I love that idea that it's even acknowledged by a prophet of God himself that, you know, they're not 100% always going to get everything right. Um, so, so I guess one of the, I have a couple questions. Well, I guess my main question is, uh, so the whole book is about, how we need to fact check and, 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 and you give us exercises and, and skills and resources and all sorts of things that we can do when we're reading something on the internet or an, in a book or an article or whatever, or, or a comment that comes up in Sunday school. But I guess the question I wanted to ask is how often do you think it's important to apply these principles to even things that the church publishes or things that maybe that are said in general conference do, do these, these same skills apply when we're listening to church leaders or when we're reading church approved materials? Of course they apply. And to the question of how often, I would answer every single time. You know, I think, uh, and I think the scriptures teach the same thing. You know, the Doctrine and Covenants teaches us that true learning by the Spirit occurs when the speaker has the Spirit and the receiver has the Spirit. And both have the duty. Brigham Young uh, said one time, I referenced in the book, one of his fears is that members of the church would just take everything their leaders say. Uh, and not go to the Lord and seek a confirmation for themselves. And so, uh, yeah, I would say all the, of the information we get, we need to be thinking about. That's, that's what we're charged to do. That's a really powerful statement. I, I, it's actually just, uh, just the other day I was watching, there's a channel on YouTube of a Vox reporter who focuses on like border communities, but it turns out he was once LDS and he randomly published a video entitled why I left the Mormon church. And I thought oh, he did a thoughtful job. It wasn't like a, a hatchet job or anything. Um, but one of the things he said that struck me that I thought was maybe a bit unfair was sort of along those lines. He said like, you know, it's a group that, that stresses obedience above like the self above the individual thinking things through. And I don't think that's exactly fair. I understand sort of how people get there and maybe we need to do more to evangelize that component of our discipleship because it, I don't think people always understand that like we can listen to the remarks in, in general conference, but we can still take them under consideration and pray about them and come to our own witness about them. But but with that said, when we have this culture of not, not necessarily even an infallibility, but prophets who are speaking in an official capacity, um, and if they could be wrong, like what, what do we say to people who find that maybe disconcerting in terms of their own faith, if they're having struggles and doubts? I mean, the Joseph Fielding Smith one, I think is a, a minor example, perhaps, but if someone based their testimony on every word the prophet said, and they were geared up and saying, we're never going to the moon, God doesn't want us to go there. And then that was the other way. And his response was, well, I was wrong, wasn't I? There, I could, you know, you could see people who could struggle with that response. What do you say to people who are in that situation? Or of course, you could port it over to uh, our day, and I'm sure other there have been other utterances that are similar to that. But what do we, what do we say to those who struggle in that regard and can't find peace when it turns out the, the brethren might have just been wrong about something? Yeah, I think the root cause of this the struggle, and I, I think that the struggle is real. I think it's really painful for many people. At its root, I think it's a it's a thinking flaw that oversimplifies kind of reality, all of the the nuance and and excitement of reality, into a simple either or 
binary. So either the prophet is perfect and everything he says, I just have to follow, or uh, he's not. He's just a man and he's making it up and it's terrible. And if, if I come to it with that binary, then I'm always going to struggle because uh, no prophet ever measures up. And what's funny about this is you'd think that if we read the scriptures and find case after case after case of prophets saying, uh, I'm not good enough, uh, I'm slow of speech, don't call me, uh, running away from their calls. I mean, Jesus calls Peter Satan. Uh, I mean, that's not just like, hey, Peter, try a little harder, do a little better. That, that's serious charge that, yeah. that, the, that the Savior levels at Peter. And so we're not reading all of the prophets in context. And then we have this narrow binary view. So we need to kind of give ourselves space for prophets to not be either or, but to be more. I, one story in the scriptures that I think is really helpful with this is the story of uh, going back, Nephi and his brothers going back to get the plates. But we usually tell it in the binary way, Nephi versus Laman and Lemuel. So what about if it's, your perspective is Sam? What if you're Sam? Your father's the prophet, asks you to go, and you go. Uh, your brother is, uh, you know, the spirit is strong with him, and uh, he's kind of inspired. So, so you side with Nephi. So what do you get for that? Well, uh, you get your life threatened. You get beat up. You get all your property stolen. Because um, I think that's part of the, uh, the oversimplification. We assume the prophet never mis makes a mistake. Then if I follow them, nothing ever goes wrong. Well, Sam basically has a really terrible time. And then at the end, they do uh, it does work out. And, and Nephi, in a way, is like doing this trial by error, right? They're just... They don't know how to make it work, and so they're trying. So what are Sam's options? At the end of the first attempt, Sam, if Sam's got the either-or view, he's like, okay, this failed, I'm out. Uh, but if he's got the other view of, you know, my brother is infallible, now he's scratching his head. Well, that should have worked. We, we drew straws, we sent Layman in, and it didn't work. Now I'm having a faith crisis. No, Sam had room to say, well, let's let's keep working here. Let's let's try this out. We'll try another one. We'll try a third one. Uh, and so, that's what I think we need to do: is give ourselves and the prophet space to have a little bit more of of humanity. Because one thing we know about the prophets is God doesn't tell them everything. That's another kind of false assumption. The prophet doesn't just like open his mouth and a radio broadcast from heaven is just immediately broadcast out. The prophet is thinking about things, studying them, and they tell us this all the time in their talks at General Conference. I was reading the scriptures. I was studying this. We were counseling together. They're, they are literally telling us we are working to understand things, and here's what we understand. And we're the ones that run off and say, that was perfect or not perfect. or So we're, we're disconnected, and we need to get better connected. Yeah, Alma does the same thing when he's talking to his son and he's answering his questions about the resurrection and stuff. And he says, I fasted and prayed, you know, you know, a lot to, to know these things. And then even after he says that and he starts to explain it, there are several times where he says, but I don't know this part. I, I don't know that. I don't know, you know, if there's going to be more than one resurrection or, or whatever. You know, there's a few times where even after he talks about how hard he worked and how an angel, you know, taught him or how revelation taught him. He still says, and I still have some blanks to fill in. So I think that's a good example, too, to illustrate and, what you're talking about. And that happens recently. President Oaks gave a talk a few years ago where he said, you know, we don't know everything about what happens after we die. And so, and that's where Alma was in that same space. After death, there's a lot of holes. And, and if, but if we have this compulsion to fill the holes, that everything has to be uh, totally locked down and perfect, well, that's a problem too. We need to give leave space for holes and not rush to fill in the gaps. Well, kind of keeping on this thread, then I'm. What do we do though if someone maybe isn't rushing to fill in the gaps, but they're struggling with with, with some aspect of thing? I mean, I'm thinking of President Nelson's conference address just this past April, for example. You know, he gave that address, talked a lot about working through doubts. Uh, your your book also has some uh, some uh, references of, of good sources we can look at to find information. Um, and they're largely church approved, but like, what do you, 
I guess there was that quote that went around in a lot of circles, that line, lazy learners kind of went around. That that did a lot of rounds. A lot of people, I saw many on Twitter, which I should never be on Twitter in the first place, but I saw people on Twitter um, who took offense to that. Because I know, I know many who have unfortunately left the church and they wouldn't describe themselves perhaps as lazy learners. They would describe themselves as individuals who, who really waxed hard and have spent untold number of hours and, and pain and anguish trying to work through their doubts and their questions with the church. And they still kind of can't get there. They still find themselves uh, in opposition either to the church or the teachings, and they feel the best course of action is for them to, you know, to walk a, to walk away from the church more or less. So, like, I'm curious what you would say to those people, the people who are working really hard to work through things and trying to do the best they can with good sources, but there's still that disconnect. You know, like, what what do we say to them to help? Them? Other than, of course, you know, prophets can be fallible. We need to give the prophets some space. But do you have anything beyond that that you would suggest? Yeah, you know, in chapter sixteen in the book is kind of where I go mo- most in depth in this area. But I do think there are, um, you know, really three Im- kind of big important ideas that I, that I uh, that I think are helpful. I mean, people I've talked to and uh, that I know and and myself personally, they've been helpful. Uh, and they all involve work. Uh, none of them involve. So I think the people who are really working, I think the first thing we say is keep at it, keep going. You're doing the right thing uh, because there is an assumption. You know, we tell, we often tell the first vision story uh, like it's really quick. Like Joseph uh, had a question and he read the Bible and then the answer came. But uh, in Joseph's own records, he talks about working on this for years. Uh, Brigham Young learns about the church and doesn't join for two years after learning about it. And so Brigham uh, is thinking through things. So I think thinking, taking time, you know, there's no promise that it comes quick. So, so stay at it. But then within that, I I think it's important to pay attention, you know, to the specific issues. And I think, I think the people who struggle with things are better at this than people who try to help them. People who try to help will come in and kind of want to gloss it over really quickly. But the people who are struggling, they have really specific things. And and even if you're trying to help somebody uh, and maybe you've struggled about the same topic, you might have struggled about a different angle on it. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because some of these topics like uh, priesthood ban or plural marriage, they've got lots of angles. These are big, hairy topics. And so you want to, you, you got to pay attention to the detail. But then I do think another thing is, I think there's a script, a, a social script, a, 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 you know, a kind of social convention for talking about faith crises is the, the term that we've used. Uh, but I think the script rests on an oversimplified binary. I mean, it's, a, it's the either or, stay, I, I stay or leave. And that, that kind of what drives it. And I think there are other scripts. There are other ways to narrate what we're doing. Uh, one of them is, you know, trials are trying. Uh, why? Somehow we, we think uh, a faith crisis is different than a struggle with cancer. Uh, and we might know, oh, well, yeah, I'll have to deal with cancer for years. But my faith crisis, I've got to, you know, solve today. Well, why not? You know, life, mortal life is filled with trials. Some of them go a long time. You know, that's not just because it takes a while doesn't mean it's not working. Uh, it just might take a while. I think the last kind of general thought I would share is that, you know, when people struggle, they, they lack peace. And, and I think it's really significant that Jesus calls himself the Prince of Peace. I think it's significant that the Holy Ghost can speak, the scriptures teaches over and over, that the Holy Ghost can speak peace to our minds, peace to our hearts. And Paul describes it one way, that the peace passeth understanding which to me means that peace is not the same as certainty. Uh, peace can be different. Uh, I, there can be things I don't know, I don't understand, and peace is separate. And so, so I encourage people to seek, as part of their understanding, uh, is seek peace. And not from me and not from a church website or a video. You've got to go to the Prince of Peace for that kind of peace. And, and, and that promise is available to every individual person. I wonder if we could uh, switch gears a little bit. I wanted to talk a little bit about another uh, sort of running thread through the book. And you, you you introduced kind of early on the idea of the need or the 
yeah, I guess the need to constantly revise our understanding of history. And I like that you use that word revise and used it in a very positive way because often you hear people kind of dismissively and pejoratively use the term revisionist history, like, oh, they, they revised the story. Uh, but you talk about how, you know, that, that, there, that re- history requires us to continually revise. And, and you, one of the story, examples you gave is how the Doctrine and Covenants heading for Section 135 used to be attributed to John Taylor. And after a lot of review and delving into the sources, you know, in the 2013 edition, the, the church removed that. Uh, that also made me think about uh, we used to have a narrative about jo- uh, John Taylor's pocket watch. I remember my dad, like, really emotionally, we're in the Church History Museum. He's showing us the pocket watch and talking about how it stopped the bullets and saved his life. And now it says in the, the display case, it says that it broke when he when it hit against the windowsill. And so we've revised that story. And so I guess I have two questions related to this. First of all, can you, I'd like you to explain why is it important? Why is it necessary to continually revise our understanding of history? And then second of all, why are people so resistant to it? You know, people get angry when they hear a news story about John Taylor. People got angry when you debunked Elvis Presley's copy of the Book of Mormon with his notes in it. Like, why are people upset about things like this? Why do we want to hold on to the things that are being revised? But first, why do we need the revision in the first place? Yeah, those are all great questions. And you're right. There were a lot of angry people at the Elvis uh forgery but and who um, would be mad about that's just, that's for me that's just a funny one to be mad about it's it's not like it's we want like, the king to have been on the it, verge of conversion it's like that meme that goes on facebook that shows snoop dogg with the book of mormon like it's the same one like we just like we care so much if the lay public like cares about our scripture sorry keith continue. well we're, so. we're in maybe i'll maybe i'll do the questions backwards and kind of back out of it from the elvis example uh because i think there were a couple reasons why people were uh, upset, and um, but it, but it's less about facts. So the the facts are Elvis in a book, but I think there are more things that happen. So one of them is when it kind of gets tied to a personal narrative. So some of the people who talked to me afterwards said, you know, well that story I heard that story while I was contemplating joining the church, and it was influential to me. Uh, so, so the Elvis story is over here. My conversion story is over here, but I've blended them because of the way they fit in the timeline. So what it's tugging on is their conversion story, not necessarily Elvis, but it's where it's, it's tied in, uh, to that story. Uh, then there was another category of people who were upset. And this one was one I didn't anticipate. Uh, but it was people in the music industry for whom the Elvis Book of Mormon kind of justified their place in the industry because the industry is tough and there's, you know, criticism like, you know, your Mormon lifestyle doesn't fit here. You don't belong here. But there was a sense uh, unspoken, but then spoken by people who would talk to me and said, you know, I had a hard time uh, in in the business, but what helped me was that Elvis knew about us and our beliefs and he was okay with it. And if it's good enough for the King, then it's good enough for me. And I have a place in this business. And so again, it's less the specific facts. What did Elvis think or whatever, but they've tied it onto their own identity and their, their kind of sense of fitting within the industry. So so I think that's where the resistance to revision comes from, is when the stories from history get attached to other things that are, are personal, that are emotional, that are, that are about our identities, that are about our personalities, about where we fit in the world. Because revising that then is a challenge to, well, where do I fit in the world now, if that's uh, what I thought. So, but it takes you know mental discipline to separate the Elvis story from my conversion story and say, Okay, no, my conversion came because I got yeah. an answer to my prayer. Lots of things along the way helped. You know, someone brought me dinner, and uh, you know, the missionaries were fun to talk to. And but there, there are pieces there. So back out to the big question. You know, why why do we revise? Why should we revise? I think there are there's some reasons in history, in the discipline of history. But then I also think there are reasons in our own doctrine. The 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 disciplinary history reasons are. 
uh, that new sources surface all the time. Uh, they're hiding in people's attics. Uh, they're buried in a box of, you know, a hundred boxes of papers that get donated. And it's a long time before somebody finds them. We're, we're always encountering sources that offer us uh, new insight. And so we would celebrate that. You know, if tomorrow a new letter surfaced of Abraham Lincoln talking about the Gettysburg Address, that'd be headline news. New letter, new sheds, new light uh, on Lincoln's thoughts about the Gettysburg Address. But I think we also revise history because we are different. And this gets back to the interpretation question and the fact that you can't get around interpretation. And so people who wrote and talked about histories in the 1890s, 1920s, they looked at white, male, powerful political figures. Uh, in the mid-20th century, a whole bunch of things happen in our country, socially, culturally, economically, that say, hey, wait a minute, there are other people. There are, my goodness, there were women in history. Oh, wow, there were minorities in history. Oh, there were men who didn't own property uh, in history. Uh, and so, so that isn't, the past didn't change. What changed is we, as a people, as a culture, said, hey, we want to know about other stuff, not just the stuff that we we heard before. And so we ask new questions. We, then we have new social problems. You know, we have uh, major issues with race in the United States now. Last year, one of the ways it manifests itself was toppling of monuments. So some people react by saying, oh, no, you can't tear down monuments. My reaction was, that's what we do. We, we revise things because we're now, and this question is coming from its own place of identity and pain and personality and community and asking, how come we're not in the story? How, or how come the story misrepresents us? And so I think as long as there's more than one person in the conversation, you're going to be asking new questions. And that just multiplies over the, the breadth of the community and then over the over the length of time. Now, on the doctrinal side, we believe all kinds of things in our scriptures, like God will reveal line upon line, here a little, there a little. Uh, we believe that God will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to him. We memorize these things. We believe these things. But then as soon as somebody, uh, a church leader says, okay, we're going to do something different, we say, whoa, 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 whoa. I, don't, don't do that. Don't change that. Isn't that what we believe? Don't we? And But there are some implications we don't think about. If we believe that, then what we're saying, in effect, is there are many great and important things that President Russell M. Nelson does not know. Otherwise, God can't reveal them. It, I mean, we believe that's going to happen. It also means we believe President Nelson knows more than President Hinckley, and he knew more than President McKay, and he knew more than President mm -hmm. Woodruff. And so do we believe that or, or don't we? But if we do then we need to start seeing that in our practice. Okay, we can change things. The president of the church can totally change programs and procedures. Uh, one of the phrases I love that people have started using in recent times is ongoing restoration. I think that's wonderful. We used to think that the restoration happened in 1830. I love the fact that it's ongoing. And that speaks to this, this belief, this doctrine that God, Jesus is a living Christ. He speaks to a living prophet. And uh, things change. That's great. Okay. I don't know if Jared was about to say something, but I'm hopping in. So, unless Jared's got something bad. But I just want to, just building upon that, I'm thinking about how we fact check. And the, as a people, we're oddly resistant to fact checking. Like, like for example, there's a one page where you mentioned, you're talking about where you can fact check things. And you, you mentioned Snopes first and foremost which I think is a perfectly fine site, but Snopes has found itself in the political crosshairs in the past number of years. And so, and pe people, people scoff at fact checkers, right? And Phil, I mean, you talk about whether it's been COVID misinformation, things in general, like why do you think we are so resistant to fact checking overall? Well, I, I think it's two, maybe twofold reason. Uh, one is it's hard work. Uh, we talked a little earlier about cognitively, our brains like to just kind of take things and go with them. Uh, I mean, that's the reason why. And, and social media is built this way. It's built to just keep you doom scrolling forever and ever and faster and faster and click like. That's a, a, a technology 
that has capitalized on our desire to just not think. TV figured it out before and, and other things like that. But mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I think that's part of it. That it's hard work. And, you know, you come home at the end of the day, you win at work, you're really tired. Uh, you don't want to say, okay, let me get out all of my mental tools and figure out if this is right. Yeah. And so uh, it, it's hard work. Uh, but I think the other kind of reason, kind of category of reason, relates to what we were talking about, revision. Uh, sometimes the information that's incorrect is also wedded to our notions of identity uh, or our community or the political party that we're part of or the team we're on, the tribe we're in. And so when information, and there are various studies of misinformation, when it comes from within our group of our same tribe uh, and it's something we already like, uh, we, I mean, we want the thing to be true before it even comes to us. Then when it comes to us, we're like, yeah, that's, that's true. The Elvis Book of Mormon thing had a, had a little bit of that too. You know, Latter-day Saints just want famous people to uh, like us. And, and so when it comes yeah. our way, it's like, oh, good. Finally, someone's not persecuting us. Look, a famous person likes us. And we're like, just like predisposed to welcome that without a double check. That's actually the same question I was going to ask Jeff. So I'll ask a different question. That's sort of sort of like, a follow like on um, that that sort of or sort of related just to this whole thing that we've been talking about. And in, in addition to fact checking and and sort of this idea of like a revisionist history that people reject, I think in general though sometimes people are just resistant. Not even if it's a revisionist, but just then when we get new things. And this the, this idea came to me as I was reading your book, and also because uh, I also unfortunately do scroll through Twitter. But I saw a really funny post from Artist Partial, who's, uh, I think, a pretty good amateur LDS uh, historian. And uh, I follow her yeah, her blog and her tweets uh, very enthusiastically. But she, she shared that uh, she was once interrupted during, while she was teaching gospel doctrine. She was told to, I'll quote here, shut, down, shut up and sit down because I had shown the picture of the seer stone in the Joseph Smith Papers volume. And the man who told her to shut up and sit down said, those books are published by renegade historians. So, um, yeah. So again, I, I guess it's kind of the same question, but I mean, but, but before we were kind of talking about just sort of like our, our political beliefs that we hold or just sort of the biases that we want, but why, uh, why is sort of normal? I mean, I don't think the people who work on Joseph Smith papers are renegade historians, but they're, but these, this man viewed them as rebellious somehow or anti, you know, anti church or anti Jesus or anti Joseph Smith. Why, again, why are we having this, re seeing this reaction? I can understand it a little bit more when it's to, you know, oh, this uh, goes against my political beliefs, but you know, I, to me, nothing about the Joseph Smith papers project suggests renegade history. Why would people react negatively to a church sponsored church funded work of scholarship? Well, I don't fully understand it, but you're right. There's there's lots of uh, reaction to that kind of information. Since we have this imaginary man that uh, artists didn't reveal and none of us know, we can dissect him. Well, she didn't say who it was, but I was trying to keep it big. But you oh, know, I, okay. didn't wanna, I didn't want to well, have anybody. We we'll, we'll we'll just we'll we'll just analyze an, an anonymous imaginary re reactionary person. You know, the Searstone case is an interesting one because. Uh, yes, the photograph was published in the Joseph Smith papers. That was the first place that it was published. And then uh, two, three months later, it was published in the Ensign. So we've kind of leaped from the, the so-called renegade historians to the church magazine. But then there's a kind of just a larger backstory. Uh, President Nelson, when he was a member of the Twelve, uh, taught about the Seer Stone at a mission president seminar that was published in the Ensign as they you know, publish. Uh, talks that get given in, in places. Neil A. Maxwell was in the end sign talking about it. So one part of it is, a, is just a kind of, and, and I'm not saying you, you have to read every article in the end sign because nobody does, but there is just a kind of, well, I've never heard it before. The, the reflex is, well, I've never heard it before, so it couldn't be so. When And we need to get a reflex, which is, I've never heard that before. I wonder if anyone else has talked about it. And then that becomes... Uh, then you find President Nelson, you find uh, Elder Maxwell, you, you know, other things like that. There's a, there's a phrase in the literature on history, teaching, and learning that calls this uh, lateral reading. And frequently, when we're trying to evaluate information, we read vertically. 
So we get to a website and we read everything on the web page because we think that's going to help us. But the lateral read would say, let me go look around in the context of this information. Does anybody else quote this? Who links to this web page? Who owns this web page? Uh, can I corroborate this on Wikipedia or Snopes or any other place? And it doesn't mean that Snopes is right all the time. It doesn't mean Wikipedia is right all the time. But it means that if I can go and start to find this in other places, and those other places may link to sources, I can then start to find uh, where the information is coming from, rather than staying within the container of somebody served this up to me, and so therefore that's the, the whole universe, just what they fed me. This is just my own curiosity, but were you involved in the uh, the whole process of deciding to publish more publicly about the seer stone? I mean, I remember this this sent it, it was amazing. It sent shockwaves through a lot of the community because this thing that a lot of people knew about, and then the church was sort of embracing it as more of, as part of the more public narrative. Were, were you part of any of that process? I, I was, but I was at the end. So I came into church employment in 2014 uh, mm -hmm. in the summer, uh, in and then that was published the following summer. Uh, August of 2015. So I was not there in the beginning when they were deciding to do it, but I was there in that last year as we were talking it through and, and kind of strategizing. We actually uh, released it in the Joseph Smith Papers, and at the same time, the Church History Museum in Salt Lake City was being remodeled. So a photograph of it went up in the museum. And at the same time, we dedicated the uh, priesthood restoration site in Harmony and so there was a photograph in Harmony. So all three of those were coordinated. Uh, so there was a lot of work. But I came in for the coordination side, not the, the decision part of it. And obviously, so you weren't there as part of the decision. But do you know in the, any of the history of it? Was there what, what drove the decision to, for, for someone in the upper echelons of church leadership to say, you know what, let's, let's change the narrative to be more historically accurate, not show Joseph Smith, you know, looking at the plates, the typical things we've seen for a long time. Do, yeah. do you know anything about how that how it came about in the first place? Yeah, well, I mean, it was published in the volume. The Joseph Smith Papers has almost two dozen volumes by the time mm -hmm. it's done. But the, the volume that it was published in was the printer's manuscript. And so it was in that process of describing and needing to describe as part of the Joseph Smith Papers, how did the translation happen? Uh, and in that process, you know, how do you tell the story without telling all the story? And so that was kind of the uh, the starting point. But but by then, by you know, by in 2015 when it was published, the Joseph Smith papers had already been underway for about a decade. So there were the precursor was was the big commitment on the part of the church to say, we are going to find and publish and and annotate everything that we can that's related to Joseph Smith. And so that would be the big if you're looking for kind of a, a change in strategy, it would be that one to to publish the mm -hmm. Joseph Smith papers. And then along the way, we get uh, lots of kind of tactical decisions of, okay, we have we need to talk about this more. We need to talk about that. We need to talk about the translation process. Well, why not include a photograph? You know, so off we go. There'll be, and I'll, there'll yeah. be a little do, bit more. Do the stones reside in the library? No. They, they are, the, that stone is held in the possession of the first presidency. So it's not part of the library's really collection. Yep. Which is true for all kinds of things. The library does not have stewardship for all of the things in everybody's office and personal files. And, right. You know, so we basically get Including the things. The they get. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that one was never even transferred from more Moroni's library. That was a bummer. <laughs> yeah. No, I like that you talked about that very specifically. You know, and, and it isn't it till later till you talk about the principle of provenance, but you, you trace the provenance of the sort of Laban and you say, and this is where it's cut off. And we don't know who got it after that, but it's not anybody here. Well, and I don't know if Moroni listens to your podcast, but I, I'm always open. Every time I talk about it, I'm open. If he ever wants to transfer it to the collection, we'd take it. Is there a, like just in your, in your experience there working in the church history library, what's the, for you, the most interesting or, you know, or notable object you've been able to work with or come across in your position? Huh. You know, um, this is a hard question to answer because it's like day in, day out. There's all kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, and they're all interesting in their own kind of way. You know, honestly, the Elvis Book of Mormon is probably the one item that I spent the most time with. You, you know, most items don't, I don't get to spend hours and hours and thinking and researching. So there, there was a, for me as a researcher, there was 
that was fun. Uh, and then to to be able to come up with new knowledge and new information, that's also rewarding too. So, uh, but you know, there are other things people ask on a personal level. My answer is, you know, my patriarchal blessing, the library, when patriarchs send blessings to the church, it comes to the library. And so uh, the most significant personal thing in the whole collection would be that. Uh, so, so yeah, it's a whole range, but then they're really um, cool things. The book of Mormon manuscripts are really awesome. Uh, and you just yeah. kind of, to see the thing, uh, later this year, the Joseph Smith Papers are going to publish the original manuscript, uh, the volume of the original manuscript. And so to see the paper where well, Joseph well, we dictated... we have left of it, right? Cause it, yeah, it, the, the fragments. There's about 28% of it left, we estimate. Uh, but photographs of those fragments will be published uh, online and in the book. And um, But yeah, to see that paper and think, you know, Joseph dictated, the scribe wrote, that is... The closest thing we have that is that it's the beginning and it's always cool to look at those fragments so we have one on display in the library anybody can walk in uh any day uh after august when we reopen uh, from the pandemic but they're on display every day you can check out some fragments so Uh, I know we're running up against time jeff but I, I wanted to ask just one more question this and just to satisfy my personal curiosity uh -huh. uh, there's a whole section in the book, you know, where you address the, the importance of, you know, the, the admonition that's given to us a couple of times in the Doctrine and Covenants to seek learning out of the best books. And you give us some resources of where to start looking for some of these best books that can inform our study or help us to understand things better or help us to delve into the history in a good way. Uh, but I was curious if you had any personal best books that you found helpful to you or that you would recommend, uh, you know, your recommended reads uh, as far as some, some of these best books that we can delve into. Yeah, uh, I have lists and lists of best books. Uh, sometimes it helps if, to be a little more uh, focused in, in the list. Um, what's the topic for your best book? Let's, let's stick with, I mean, we've been talking a lot about uh, like church history. Let, let's even, let's narrow it down. Let's say early 20th century church history. Like what, how do we learn well about what's going on back when oh. Joseph F. Smith is president of the church? That's a great question, because I think you hit one era that's least understood. I was and about to say that, too. I was, I was about to say, Jared, well, no, no, mid-20th century. That's the interesting part, right? No, but no, I, I, I think will, early 20th century uh, is a fun one. So uh, one that doesn't exist yet, but Saints Volume 3 will treat that era. And as mm. we've worked through it, and I've, I've reviewed the manuscript, it is kind of exciting to say, oh, wow, there's... There's a lot of cool things happening here, but that was not available. So uh, I think the first place to start for early 20th century is a book by a historian named Tom Alexander called Mormonism in Transition. And he runs 1890 to 1930 and just goes through. Uh, and, and his conclusion is there in the title that it was a tremendous period of transition for the church across every front uh, in its organizational structure uh, missionary work, uh, the role of participation of women, uh, that's, uh, that, I, that would, I would say that would be the starting point if you're looking at early 20th century. Cool. Thanks. I've got like so many random questions, but uh, they could be whole other discussions. We Shoot. Can One thing, Shoot, this could be me. super brief if you, know, if you don't want to respond to it. In the, you're sure it ain't fake section, which I think is a very worthwhile part for us to work through. I think you kind of alluded brief. You mentioned briefly Mark Hoffman, and just because of in light of the Murder Among the Mormons miniseries that's been on people's minds this spring, I was kind of surprised the whole Salamander affair didn't make more of just of an appearance in the book. Was there any reason why you didn't go too much more into detail? Because it was a in the eighties that was a very big deal because that that level of forgery got up to some pretty high levels. So any reason you didn't go for it? Yeah, and it was a big deal, and and is a big deal historically. Uh, the book is written to help kind of normal people think through things. And if there was any lesson from the salamander letter experience, uh, it required some seriously not normal investigative skills to figure that out. And so I think setting that as a bar, like, you know, when you <laughs> finish fair. my book, you can uh, uncover the Hoffman forgery. Uh, you know, no way. You know, George Throckmorton, the document examiner who did that, had thousands of hours of experience under his belt. And everybody... Uh, said he was crazy and wrong. And so, so I mention it, uh, at the kind of the beginning of that chapter as one of the, the famous, you know, forgeries from our past. 
And then I mentioned a little bit at the end, but more in the in the footnotes uh, when I talk about that these these forgeries do continue to surface, and uh, it requires you know really sophisticated things like ultraviolet light and uh, mm-hmm. things that just people don't have in their house. So 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 yeah, that's it, it's in there because it's important. But in this context, you know, nobody is going to become George Throckmorton overnight. And so if you want to do that, you're going to have to take a, make a career choice uh, to, yeah, to get yeah. to that level of analysis. That's good. That's, that's a good response. I like that one. Um, you do mention Book of Mormon geography, which is a whole other thing. Yep. All, outside of, I just want to know as you, Keith Erickson, do you have an opinion on Book of Mormon geography? I don't. You know, I've read all okay. kinds of stuff. Uh, there was a period as I was writing the book where I literally called everything out of our collection that we had. And, you know, I read through, I mean, it, it took months reading through these things and uh, you know, I didn't get any smarter for reading through it all because there's really two gaps uh, and it goes two ways. One on one side, there is literally nothing in the text that points to anything recognizable today. You got narrow neck of land, you got a big hill, you got a river, but, you know, the word Panama, the word Mexico, nothing uh, in the text gives us any solid clue. It's always guesses and extrapolations and parallels and coincidences. The other problem runs the other way. So far, there is nothing come out of the ground that gives us any clue. No stone with the word Nephi carved in it. You know, no no metal coin that says Shiblom or whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. And so... That gap is just so huge. Now, uh, a few years ago, somebody did an analysis that said 2% of the American continents have been submitted to archaeological investigation. So, so that's a lot of room for stuff to happen, but the odds of hitting it right uh, in the other 98% of territory are, are really huge. So I just can't get past the gap. The book doesn't say yeah. anything. The, the ground hasn't said anything. So it's too big for me. One thing I've always thought was interesting outside of the geography is just that the name Moroni and today the capital of the country, the Comoros in East Africa, the capital city is Moroni. And I'm not smart enough. I've tried to find any threads or I wanted to see if like the city dated back to Nephi's times to wonder if that's like where they picked up on the name or something like that. But I've never found anything. And I if there is any scholarly work on that, you're welcome to send it my way. Cause I've always been, I've just been fascinated when I was a kid, I learned all the capital cities of the world. Cause that's what kids do, right? That's how you spend your time. And I, uh, I was like, Moroni? Why is it called Moroni? Is every, and I was like, you know, a 12 year old, I was like, is everyone Mormon on this island? Is this why it's called Moroni? <laughs> well, I know absolutely nothing about it. But if I had to yeah. guess, I'd guess it would have to do with Spanish or Portuguese linguistic traditions. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. You know, there, when I was a missionary in Brazil, I was in an area where a local politician, his last name was Moroni. And so the town was plastered with signs that said, vote for Moroni. Yeah. So we'd go out with the Book of Mormon and say, here's how you vote. Read the book, you know. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, it's not it's not a unique uh, name in all of yeah. linguistic well, history. But. It is sad. We can't we, we're voting for Moroni less and less on the temples these days. But that's just how things are going. <laughs> <in general. laughs> OK, last question just for funsies. You have a couple Star Wars references in the book here and there to illustrate points. That's true. And there's one Luke Skywalker quote that you have that I assume is from The Last Jedi. So it is. To get some hot takes, are you pro or con Last Jedi? Because unlike the things we've discussed, this is either or. It is a binary answer I find <laughs> in the zeitgeist. Well, if you read carefully, you notice that I didn't quote Luke because he actually expresses that idea two different ways. Uh, once to Ray, and then uh, once later to... Um, ben Moore. Yeah, yeah, Ben. Kylo Ren. Ben. Kylo Ren, yeah. Ben. Uh, but the idea that everything you just said was wrong. Um, you know, I was, when I first watched The Last Jedi, I was still open to it. Um, and so some of, well, here's the part that I liked. I liked that they expanded the force to do more stuff. Now, some of the things they expanded it to do, I thought were kind of cheesy, like, Leia being unconscious in space and pulling herself back in a ship with the Force felt a little bit too much. Mary Poppins well, that's Leia. Fair. That was fair. Yeah. But I liked yeah. that they were trying. Uh, and I liked, you know, you know the, 
I actually thought the force projection thing was kind of cool. Uh, you know, we'd never seen that before, but it was dramatic. Uh, and then he just kind of evaporates at the end, like Obi Wan. So, so on that, so I, I'll say I, I liked the uh, the expansion of the force. I thought Luke was too grumpy. I mean, where, I, the, you wanted a quick answer. I'm going to give you a full. <laughs> no, analysis. I like this. I've clear. I've clearly tapped into something you've thought a lot about. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I yeah. thought Luke was too grumpy for his character arc. Like, and they didn't give me enough reason why he got so grumpy, right? So I actually saw this at a meme just the other day on Facebook or somewhere. Well, somebody pointed out, you know, that Darth Vader kills thousands of people and all of the, the baby Jedi. And Luke says, they're still good in him. And then Ben has one bad dream and Luke says, he has to die. So, but what was missing was the character arc of how did he get so grumpy and that that part just didn't fit. Uh, I was okay with a grumpy Luke, but I needed. I I mean, I'm okay with the idea of a grumpy Luke, but they didn't they didn't build it for me. So, well, that was, and uh, we could go on and on, but I better, maybe we better stop. There. Well, for the second hour of the podcast, we'll be dissecting <laughs> the Star Wars sequel trilogy and why why the Rise of Skywalker is a complete disaster. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, that would well, be been an great. easier uh, argument to make. That isn't. I've I have not watched it once since the theater. I, I've on a, I'm on a maybe I should hate watch it some night just for fun. I don't know. I did I rewatch know. it and I liked it. I liked some bit of it better and some of it less on the second watching. So I don't know. Anyway, who's to say? Been, well, we have digressed. <laughs> this is the moment, like a missionary discussion, when you start drifting and they say you need to cut it off. This is when it's <laughs> over, right? You're losing the thread. So everyone, the book. Real versus rumor, dispelling Latter Day Saint myths. How to learn to dispel myths and things along those lines. A worthwhile read to help all of us, not just um, within things in our faith, but I think just there's plenty of secular applications here as well, and that's quite worthwhile. We'd like to thank our guest this week, Brother Keith Erickson, the director of the Church History Library. Nice enough to sit down with us and talk about his book and talk about all these great uh, subject areas. So, Keith, thank you very, very much for your time. Oh, my privilege. Thank you. It's been a delight. And uh, Jared, also wonderful to see you, my friend. Good to see you too. Always a pleasure, Jeff. So folks, thanks for listening. Hope you'll join us again next week. And uh, we love hearing from you. If you like what you hear, whatever, wherever you're getting your podcast, leave us a little five-star review there. Okay. That would be great. And until then, we'll talk to you later. Be well, be holy, and be happy. Bye-bye.